I'm doing is I'm stapling roofing felt to the sheathing of our roof. The roofing felt acts as a weatherproof skin underneath the shingles we'll be putting on later. I'm rolling it out as smoothly as I can where I started at the bottom. With each consecutive course, I'm sure to overlap the edges until the entire roof is covered. We're installing our composition shingle roof. We begin with this starter roll piece. It's simply a continuous roll of composition shingle material. You position it here at the lower edge of the roof so it overhangs the fascia by three quarters of an inch. That way the rainwater will drip free from the building materials. Start at one end of the roof and roll this piece out all the way to the other end. Fastening it about every 12 inches here at the top edge. Once this piece is in place, you can begin installing your individual shingles. Once we lay our starter row, we're ready to apply our shingles. Now we place our shingle at the bottom directly on top of the starter row, so we'll end up with a double layer of roofing material. We place it near the middle. Then we run a chalk line up the edge of one side of the shingle all the way up the roof. Then we snap another chalk line parallel to the first, extending from this small cut mark at the top of each tile. This line becomes the guideline for our next shingle. In this way, we'll get an alternating tab pattern across the roof. Then we use the top of these cut marks as a guideline to lay the edge of each tile above. Okay, that looks good. Now, Ron, do you have the nail gun down there? Sure do. There you are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of shingles to lay here, so I'm going to turn some music on to keep us company. Now we're going to show you something that's become available to the do-it-yourselfer. It's called a pneumatic nailing gun, and it simplifies any nailing project. It's powered by an air compressor, and this flexible line allows you to reach any part of the project. We like it especially because it makes the larger nailing jobs quick and easy. And it will cut in half the amount of time it takes to nail asphalt shingles to a roof. Whether nailing shingles or building a wall, always make sure you know what's on the other side. And don't forget to wear your safety goggles. On our outside shingles here, we need to keep them free so that we'll be able to slide the shingle underneath later on. At the end of this, each shingle should have four nails nailed about an inch above the cut mark for the tab. These black marks here are called wind tabs, and in a few days they'll melt so that these flaps or these tabs will stay down. Now that we've got the shingles on the four sloped faces of our roof, we can begin completing the job by applying these ridge shingles. A ridge shingle is one-third of a full three-tab shingle, and we just use our utility knife and trim these pieces out of these larger shingles. Now you start at the bottom of the roof, working your way up by snapping first a chalk line along here to give you proper alignment. And you apply the shingles one on top of the other one so that you will cover up the two nail heads that you put in the previous shingle, like this. Fold them evenly over, align it with a chalk line. and nail them in. Then when you've reached the ridge and completed that, that'll be the final step toward making your roof waterproof. And if you've done the installation properly, a roof like this should give you 25 to 30 years of life before it needs replacement. Boy, let me tell you something, that was a little bit like work. <laughs> well, we figured doing the roofing was gonna take a little bit of time. The next job we've got to do is gonna take a little time too. We're gonna tackle one of the most popular do-it-yourself projects, installing an overhead garage door opener. Now we're ready to install our electronic garage door opener. Even if you're not going to build your own garage, this is definitely a project you should consider doing yourself. Besides being an incredible convenience, an automatic garage door opener can make your garage safer and more secure. I'm putting together a unit called the T-rail. It's the track along which the trolley will slide. And this is the trolley. 
It slides along the T-rail smoothly, pulling the door arm, opening and closing the door like this. After we add the chain drive, we're ready to install the opener. Before we did anything, we checked the balance of the doors and disengaged the locks. Then we found the center point of our door to attach our door bracket. Our door bracket runs even with the top roller. And we use security bolts that run all the way through the door. Then we're ready to install our header bracket. Our header bracket also runs at the center line. But the height is determined by finding the high arc point. So we raise the door and run a level across the top to find that point. Then we'll install our header bracket about one inch above that point. If you rest that carefully, then we can line it All up. Right. That looks good. Is that got it? Yeah. yeah. Now we're ready to slip the T-rail into the header bracket, and we'll use this pin to hold it in place by sliding it into the corresponding holes. All right, here we go. Next, we position this opener assembly by setting it on this 2 by 4 block on top of the garage door, using the center line as a guide. Now we need to bolt our power head to the truss. To do that, we use these metal brackets that we measured and cut. They simply bolt to the slotted tab, and they lag screw into the wooden truss. Now what I'm doing is adding the final link to our garage door opener system. I'm adding the straight arm to the wedge here with a couple of bolts. Now we're ready to plug the unit in. It's just that simple. Installing the wall control panel is a snap by simply following the color-coded connections. Run your wires neatly up the wall through the rafters for a tidy wiring job. Then all that remains to do is simply screw it to the wall and we'll check it out. An optional safety feature with garage door openers is an electric eye. Here, I'll demonstrate by breaking the ray of light with my hand. Hey, Whoop. watch out, Ron. Well, that was close. <laughs> well, it obviously works. Damon, you got that one by two I gave you earlier in the show. Oh, you must mean this one. Yeah, I want to show you another safety feature. What's that for? Well, when a garage door drops on something that's sitting in the opening, we don't want the door to crush the object. So what it does is it stops and goes back up. Okay. Here, I'll show you. Hey. Yay. It's right. adjusted right. All right, we've got quite an array of things here. Uh, let's start out over here in this side to talk about the locks. And we've got several different kinds that I'll get more specific about in a moment. We've got strike plates, heavy duty strike plates with long throw screws for installation. We'll be showing you how to do that process later to add security to your door systems. We've got some latch guard devices and we'll show you how those go on the doors and a couple of special tools here. All right, we're ready to start installing our doorknob locking system on this front door. What we want to put in now is a standard passage lock, button-operated lock from the inside and key lock from the outside. When you buy your lock, a very important little device will come with it, this paper template. And it's got some dimensions marked on it. And uh, what you do is you fit this on the door at the height from the floor that you want your lock to be. And you mark in two places where you're going to drill holes because the first hole we're going to drill is going to be in the face of the door then we're going to drill a hole in the edge of the door for the uh, latch piece to insert there all right now that we've got our hole drilled we're going to install our spring latch and plate and to do that you simply fit it up against the face of the door and we want to mortise the edge of the door so that this plate will fit into the door. So when we're done with that operation, the surface of this uh, spring latch plate will be flush with the door edge. Now to do that, you use a razor blade knife. You get your plate in position and hold it there real firmly. And with the tip of the razor blade knife, you use the edge of the plate as a guide. And you simply scribe the wood 
marking it so you can come back in a minute with your chisel and use your chisel and your hammer to dig that wood out of there. All right, now I've completed this mortise cut in the edge of the door so that it's got a depth sufficient so that the plate is now flush with the surface of the wood. And that's what we wanted to do. So all we have to do now is put the two screws in here to hold this plate in place, and then we can assemble the passage lock in the larger hole. Now the way I do that is to drill two pilot holes through these two holes in the plate. Now I can take my screw and start it in down here. Now these are Phillips head screws, so I put a Phillips head screwdriver in my electric screwdriver gun, which ought to make this easy because I can just power these in. Okay, there it is. Now we take this passage lock and feed it in from the outside and hook it up with the edge of that latch and hopefully All right, these two screws that I've just installed don't go into the wood. They go through the hole into the mechanism on the other side. So now what I've done is I've tied these two parts of the passage lock together. And we're ready to finish this up by snapping on this cover plate. And then we slip on this knob on the end of this projection piece and pushing in that little piece there. And that's it. I'm just finishing up here with the installation of this double, or s double cylinder deadbolt. And the drilling and the mortising along the edge are the same processes that we went through with the installation of the passage lock below. Hey, it looks like you're about done. Right. Well, I'm going to go get my tools together so that we can put the stripe plate in for this deadbolt. Good, okay. okay. A couple of interesting features I want to point out to you here. You'll notice that this protrusion on the outside is tapered and it spins. Now that's because if a burglar should come up and tries to put a pipe wrench on that to torque, the, to torque this lock off the door, that particular plate won't allow him to do that because it will spin and his wrench won't grab a hold of this papered surface. Now the other interesting part is on the inside, right here, where I'm tightening up these Allen type set screws in the door to complete the installation. Uh, the manufacturer has supplied us with a couple of little rivets and you can take this rivet and you can put it in the hole of the Allen set screw and then with your hammer you simply tap that in there flat and now that's in there for keeps and nobody can ever come inside the house when they're trying to get out with a large object through this front door and unscrew these set screws and take the lock off. So I think that's just a kind of an interesting little feature about that lock. And this thing now is all ready to go. Now, the thing that you want to be mindful of when installing a strike plate is to make sure that the deadbolt is going to line up with your hole. So I've got a little tip here. If I, by closing the door, I then take a stiff object like this credit card here, and then I turn the deadbolt so it presses up against the jam, and then take the credit card and stick it between the door and the jam. I get the top, I get the bottom, make a mark at both places. Then I can get the center. And I know exactly where the deadbolt's going to be. The last thing in the world I want to have happen is install the strike plate, go to close the door and turn the deadbolt and find that it just hits the jam. All right, now we're actually ready to install the strike plate. The first thing we want to do is cut the hole for this big metal liner. And in order to get a hole this size, we're going to actually drill two holes up and down of that center line. So we're going to take a 7 8 spade bit and drill 3 8 inch below the center line and 3 8 inch above the center line. Okay. Okay, great. Now, so that the hole is just large enough to fit this, I still need to chisel out. I want to chisel out the sides a little bit. So that, because I made with the two holes, you kind of get like a figure eight kind of pattern.
Okay, so it looks like we got that mortised out. Next thing we want to install, which is the first course of our three-part assembly, is this heavy-duty plate. Now, we've got large screw holes right here that will take these long three-inch heavy-duty screws. We want to place this plate so that the screw side is to the door stop. That way, we'll be sure when the screws go in that they're not going into the trim or the sheetrock and going into the substantial part of the 2x4 behind the door jamb. Our final layers will be our metal liner. Fits in like that. And then our final finished strike plate, which goes on top. OK, now we're ready to test it out. Pull the door closed. Insert the key and turn, and we've got a hole. Building a deck is a perfect project for a beginner. It allows for a large margin of error, and since the deck is out of doors, it doesn't have to be leak proof or perfectly built. It can be completed in just a few weekends and gives you a valuable home addition at a relatively low cost. This is Robert and Avian's house where we'll be building our deck. Now the position of the deck will be from the corner of the house here, over 12 feet to about here, and it will come out 14 feet into the yard to about this position. We'll be building a staircase from the side of the deck down into the yard here, and later Robert and Avian will install a doorway from the house onto the deck. Now the first part of the construction is installation of what we call a ledger board, which is a 2 by 8 pressure treated pine board. Robert and Avian are now involved in layout measuring work so that they can drill holes in the board and we can install what are called steel lag screws to bolt the ledger board to the side of the house. Now that we've got our holes drilled in our ledger board, we want to temporarily nail the ledger board to the side of the house so that we can mark the corresponding holes in the side of the house so that we can then drill those holes. All right, now that we've got all our holes drilled and we took the uh, ledger off the wall, we can put these lag screws through the holes we had drilled in the ledger and apply the ledger to the wall. Now one of the most important issues in applying the ledger is that there be a space between the building and the back face of the ledger so that rainwater running down the building will run behind it and not cause a damp space which could cause uh, deterioration later on. So to get that space we're going to take galvanized steel washers, put them over the uh, shanks of the lag screws and then when we bolt this onto the building we'll have a built-in space. The next thing we want to do is nail up a couple of joists, one on each side, hold it up temporarily on a stake uh, out here, and drive a stake into the ground so we can hold it up temporarily, and then do some measurements to check this 90 degree angle. But because we have a particularly long piece of wood, why don't we double the sides of that triangle and make it 6 foot, 8 foot, and 10 foot. Then when we get that laid out, it'll be a good check in terms of determining this 90 degree angle. So well, let me get this straight. So if we come out this way six feet and this way eight feet and mark it and measure between the two marks when it gets to be ten feet this is the right angle right so That's we just correct. move this however we need we adjust to. it to get that uh, ten foot uh, alignment and so why don't we put the pencil marks in six okay, foot six feet out here and eight feet here right okay i've got it in place here Avi. Okay. Now when, it, when the 10 foot mark comes across the pencil line, that's it. Yeah, looks good. That's it? Right there? All right, let's take a look at why we set up these two outside joists on our deck. What we want to do next is yeah. determine the point where our concrete pier blocks are going to go that are going to hold up the deck structure. So we use these two outside joists to do that. We know in our drawing that our concrete footings are 11 feet away from the house. So Avian and Robert will measure out from the house 11 feet, set a nail in the top of each joist, and then we'll take a linen string, stretch it across from one side to the other, 
and measure in two feet, which again is the location of the uh, pier footings from the outside of the deck, and with a felt tip pen, put a mark on the string, and then we can drop a plumb bob from the string down to the ground, and that will locate the center of our concrete pier blocks, and then we can dig our holes and pour our concrete for that part of the deck structure. Okay, let's talk about concrete foundations for a minute. For a deck, it's a way to get the weight of the deck into the ground so that the deck doesn't settle. The way we accomplish that is by digging a hole in the ground that's about 16 inches in diameter and about 12 inches deep. What we do at that point is we mix up some wet concrete and we do that by buying dry mix in a bag and we simply put that into a wheelbarrow, add some water, mix it up. We pour then the wet concrete into the ground and on top of that we place a pre-cast concrete pier block. We nestle that pier block down into the wet concrete, we check the levelness of it in two directions, and then we give a few hours for that concrete to set up and we start building the wooden deck on top of it. Now that's sufficient for our deck. In some parts of the country where you have concerns about uh, cold weather and frost line, the hole may have to go a lot deeper depending on the local uh, code restrictions. Uh, another thing to consider is in earthquake country, there is frequently required a metal connector between the pier block and the wood structure of the deck. And in those parts of the country, you can in fact buy the pier block with that metal connector uh, as part of it. So what we're going to do here, uh, we've got the hole dug, we've got the concrete mixed up. We're going to go ahead and pour the concrete and set the pier block. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. That's got it. Now, the next step will be installing our girder. As you can see, I've moved the string from the top to the bottom of the joist so that I can measure and cut my 4x4 four four post. Okay, now we can get this girder in place, set it across the footing. Move that right. Our girder is made out of two 2x8s bolted one on each side of a 4x4 four four post which goes to the concrete pier footing so that the entire weight of the deck is supported through the joist system, onto the girder, through the post and into the ground. We're going to install the rest of our joists now. Avian is doing the layout work and she's going to mark with her carpenter square along the face of the ledger and we'll be installing steel joist hangers that will hold the joists in place. There are these metal saddle shapes. You lay it up against the ledger with the bottom flush with the bottom of the ledger, and you nail in one side of the joist hanger with these special joist hanger nails. You then place the joist in position, then pull the other side of the joist hanger up against the joist, and then nail in the second side of the joist hanger, and we'll do that at each position along the ledger. And after this, we'll nail galvanized sheet metal strips over each joist to protect the wood structure from moisture deterioration. All right, now the exciting part begins. We're gonna start nailing on the deck boards. For the first board, pick a nice straight one and remember that gap between the house and the construction so the water can run behind it. Nail the first board down with the end flush with the deck over here. Let it run wild on the other end so when we've got all the boards nailed in, we can take a circular saw and buzz them off with a nice clean cut. Okay, this is Control the spaces nice. between the deck boards that. using either a flat carpenter's pencil or a 16-penny nail. Also be sure the fasteners are hot dip galvanized for rust resistance. Well, let's check out and see how we're doing from the wall. What do you got? 19 9 sixteenths. My goodness, we're on the button. Often when you have the nail close to the end cut of a board, like here at this joint between these two planks, the nail will tend to split the wood. To avoid doing that, drill a pilot hole, which is to say use a drill that's a little bit smaller than the shank of the nail, and then when you nail the nail in that pilot hole, the board won't split. Okay, we're getting there. We've got one more board to nail down, but before we do that, now's our chance to measure out from the last board we nailed to a point on the joist 
We'll mark it with our carpenter square. We'll cut the joist so that when we nail the last plank down, we'll have a perfect alignment between that last board and the end of the joist. All right, we're ready to cut off the boards that we left running wild on this end of the deck. And we do that by snapping a chalk line before we use our power saw to cut the boards. Looks good. Looks real good here. How's it look down there? I got a great fit. Okay. Nail it in. Flush to the top. Now we're finally completing our deck. Robert and Avian, as you can see, have built this handrail. Now, if your deck is within 30 inches of the ground, you won't even need one, but we've decided we want one on our deck. And there are many handrail designs. Some will include seating and planters, but ours is a simple and attractive one. It's all redwood, it has a two by four top rail, and the pickets are placed so that there's no larger than a six inch space. And for stability, we bolt the whole thing together with quarter inch by two and a half inch long lag screws. Two at the bottom into the rim joist. And notice how the, both the rim joist and the handrail are miter cut so that there's no exposed end grain. This has been a real enjoyable project. And Robert and Avian have only taken a couple of weekends to complete it. And now that they've built their deck, they can do some entertaining outside. And with proper care and attention, this deck will give them many, many years of enjoyment. Boy, look at the dips and the cracks in this thing. It's yeah. completely worn out. Let's check the gap under the door here. Now, we can see it if we take this chisel and stick it underneath. It goes almost in completely. So we're definitely going to need to replace the threshold. Now, it looks like it's wedged in position here. So if we take a saw and cut across the middle of it, then we can just pry it up in two places, and that should be pretty simple. Right, so why don't we get the tools and get started? All right, let's get going. Before I cut the threshold, I set the blade on my saw so I only cut through the threshold and not into the floor. Well, it looks like this is going to pop up real easily. Got this flat bar. This comes right up. What a mess. And this one comes right up. All right, here's a stock piece of oak threshold that you can buy at any lumber yard. And uh, as you can see, removing this threshold takes a little bit of care. You want to make sure you don't chip away the trim pieces on either side. I just need to measure the doorway for the opening so I know how long to cut the threshold. Since we're not going to take this doorstop off, I want to notch around on both sides to fit around the doorstop. Okay, good. Now that we've cut and notched our threshold, we're just about ready to put it in. But before we do that, we want to make sure that we caulk between the threshold and the floor itself. This is going to seal up any air infiltration from getting in there. Now, you're probably familiar with, with caulking tubes like this that go in a caulking gun. There are cans of caulk now available under pressure that only require you to depress the end of the nozzle to release the caulking material. Okay, now that we've finished the caulking, we're ready to position our threshold. And it seems to fit in very nicely. 
Now, I'm going to attach the threshold with eight penny finish nails. They don't have heads on them so that when they're in place, you won't see the heads. Before I do that, I want to pre-drill some holes in about four spots along the threshold. Since this is made out of oak, it's very hard wood, so I don't want to split the wood or bend the nail. I've got a drill bit on here a little bit smaller than the size of the nail. Okay, now I'm ready to nail. Now that I have the nails in position, I use this nail set to drive the nails just a little bit below the surface of the wood. Then I'll come back and putty those little holes and stain and finish it to protect the threshold. That's looking good. I You're witnessing one of the earliest air compressors at work, inflating a car tire as it's deflating me. Well, so much for history. Compressed air is one of the most efficient and universal tool systems known to man. Since its evolution from the hand pump, the air compressor has been an indispensable tool, recognized for its amazing versatility and durability in the industrial, automotive, and building industries. By other professional trades, and by virtually every manufacturing firm. As in the case of all power equipment, you want to be sure and read the instruction manual and the safety labels. Okay, now there are five easy steps you need to take to operate the air compressor. First, you want to make sure that it's properly lubricated by checking the oil level. Then you can plug it into your three-pronged grounded household outlet Turn the pressure switch on right here. Close the tank drain valve, which you'll find under here. And after that, you can regulate the pressure for the project you're about to undertake and the tool you're going to use. I brought back this old hand pump to illustrate how an air compressor works. When you pull back on the handle, air is drawn into the cylinder through the top. When you push down on the handle, the air is forced out the end of the hose. At this point, the compressed air becomes an energy source which can drive a tool. With an air compressor, after the air has been compressed by the piston, it goes into the storage tank where its pressure can be maintained and its flow regulated. Changing tools is so easy with these quick change couplers. They're an inexpensive accessory that literally makes tool changing a snap. Now another accessory to the air compressor is a roofing nail gun and it will cut in half the amount of time it takes to nail asphalt shingles to a roof. Whether nailing shingles or building a wall, always make sure you know what's on the other side. And don't forget to wear your safety goggles. Another thing I might mention is you can find the specialty tools at your local tool rental outlet and other accessories that you would use more often, you can find those at your local hardware stores or home centers. Because its power source is compressed air, an air tool has very few moving parts and runs cool, keeping maintenance at a minimum. And with proper care, keeping it clean and lubricating it, it requires very few repairs or special attention. And because it's so solidly built, it's virtually indestructible. Here's a handy little blowgun, ideal for cleaning up. An inexpensive and useful tool is one of these inflation kits. There are a number of different attachments that allow you to inflate a variety of things from a basketball to automobile tires. And selecting the proper pressure for each particular application is really simple. Between the air tool and the air supply, you'll find a pressure regulator, which by turning the valve clockwise or counterclockwise, sets the amount of pressure that is right for the job and the tool. For the basketball, the range is between 10 and 15 pounds per square inch. 
For the lawnmower tire, 20 to 35. And for this bike, I set the regulator at the manufacturer's recommended 90 pounds per square inch. Spray painting is probably the most widespread use of a compressed air system, and for a good reason. Basically, there are two types of spray guns, a bleeder type and a non-bleeder type. With the bleeder type, the air runs constantly through the gun, and the trigger controls the flow of paint. Now, I'm using a non-bleeder type, where the trigger regulates the flow of air through the nozzle, as well as the flow of paint. Both types look just the same on the outside. All the differences are internal. Another variable with spray equipment is the air cap at the nozzle. Of the many air caps available that produce different styles and patterns of spray, there are two basic types, the external mix air cap and the internal mix. With the internal mix cap, the air and paint mix inside the nozzle before the spray is ejected. With the external mix air cap, the air mixes with the paint outside the nozzle. On an external mix air cap, there are two projections that have tiny holes through which the compressed air exits and atomizes the paint. For a quick drying paint like an auto paint, you'd want to use your external mix air cap. With an air compressor, I can paint a whole house as well as a professional, not to mention as fast. Be it paint, sealer, or varnish, the spray gun has no preference. And for larger jobs, like painting the siding on a house, I don't need to use the paint canister. We connected the hoses to a paint tank, which saves time from having to refill the canister. I might also mention the two types of feed used in spray equipment, pressure feed and siphon feed. With a pressure-fed gun, a pressurized canister or a pressurized paint tank is mandatory. It works on the air pressure that is built up in the canister or tank, which forces the paint out the nozzle. Many guns are convertible to be used with a paint tank instead of a typical canister. A siphon gun can only work with the external mix air cap, which is designed in such a way that a vacuum or siphon effect is created and the paint is pulled up the tube by air going out the spray nozzle. Now that our demonstration projects are finished, we can turn our compressor off. To do this, I'll simply shut off the motor, remove the plug from the outlet, turn off the regulator valve, bleed off the air and the hose through the tool, remove and store the hose, Carefully open the regulator and totally bleed off all the pressure from the tank. Last but most important, I want to open up the drain cock. This will free the tank of any moisture that might have accumulated due to condensation and prevent the chance of internal corrosion and maximize the life of the tank. And we'll leave the drain cock open until the next time we use the compressor. Okay, now let's join Kurt, who will talk to us about the other tools and tool application that make up the air compressor system. There's a seemingly endless variety of air tools available for every job you can imagine. And we can't really talk about air compressors and air tools without paying some attention to sandblasting. Whether removing rust from metal or preparing a surface for painting, a sandblasting gun is an extremely valuable tool. It's also an excellent tool for etching glass. The same sandblasting equipment is adaptable for use with soap and water in cleaning operations, for degreasing a car engine, or for use in the garden in spraying insecticides and fertilizers. Other air tools include this caulking gun, which takes the work out of sealing your house, giving a fast, clean, and uniform bead of caulk wherever it's needed. Still another tool is an air ratchet wrench which is ideal for tightening bolts as shown here in the construction of a deck. There's another air tool we should mention for its special capabilities, and that's an airbrush. This little compressed air tool is very popular with artists and hobbyists for its unique coloring and finishing abilities. Quite a variety, isn't it? And these are just part of the tools that make up the compressed air system.
Toenailing is one way to join wood, but a far stronger bond can be made using metal framing connectors. Whether you're building a deck, a garage, or a whole house, there are a number of metal connectors or fasteners you can use that will minimize the time and the sweat, eliminate toenailing, and provide strong structural support. There are framing connectors that serve specific purposes and others that have multiple uses. We're using ones made by silver metal. Because of their extensive range of building connectors that serve a multitude of building applications. Now here's one called an adjustable post anchor, which is ideal for securing a post to an existing concrete floor. It can be bolted or nailed, depending on the situation. In this case, we've bolted it, and it's slotted to allow for adjustment for plumb if necessary. So then we put the spacer in, and then the post. Avian and I have used framing connectors in many of the projects on the do-it-yourself show. In building a deck, we use these post caps to stabilize the beam that support the floor joists. Also in deck construction, as well as many building projects, joist hangers are ideal for supporting joists. They're easy to install, and again, they eliminate toenailing altogether. When working with metal connectors, you want to be sure that you use joist hanger nails of the proper length. These are special nails that are shorter than regular framing nails, and they have an extra thick shank for shear strength. In building a garage in our garage show, we use several kinds of metal connectors. Here we're embedding a foundation anchor into the freshly poured concrete pad. Then, after the concrete is set up and our walls are framed in, we bend the strap over the sole plate and nail it into place. Here you see us installing the header hanger for a door opening. We simply slide the header into the saddle of the hanger, which sits on the king studs, and nail it all together. The framing clip we used for the window sill in a similar fashion. To run electrical wire along an exterior wall, we notched the studs. And to protect the wire, we attached these metal nail guards. Still another metal connector we used in our garage construction was the rafter tie. This is a fast and easy way to secure trusses or rafters to the wall studs.